Good morning. Uh, I'm really excited to, to do this talk because it's actually the first time I can give a talk about Elixir and assume that the audience know what Elixir is, right? <laughs> so that's really great. It's really a uh, change in pace because usually I'm going to other conferences and I'm always giving the introductory talk, right? What Elixir is about, what are the language goals? So this talk's not about that, okay? This talk is about Elixir past and future. I think it's kind of expected uh, to exactly talk about from where the language came because um, now we are close to reach 1.0, right? And then there will be a lot of, and I think there are important lessons, um, things that happened throughout this process that we could share that will help the com community grow um, together. So if, if we want to talk about Elixir Past, uh, we could, one thing that we could do is that we could go to Elixir Timeline. So this, I got it from GitHub. So on the vertical, we have the number of commits. And I think it's kind of per week. And then we have the whole year of 2011. Uh, in there, and the first commit was right at the beginning of 2011, okay? It was a, like, like 9th January or something like that. But I actually want to rewind a little bit more, okay? I want to go a little bit back before 2011, but not too much. It's not about my birth or anything like that. <laughs> it's when, so I'm going back to 2005 and I choose uh, this article, uh, the free lunch is over, because it was about this time that I was personally starting to get aware of the changes that are happening. So the free lunch is over is a paper from uh, Herb Sutter, and basically what he's referring to uh, to free lunch is not about this conference. I still have free lunch, so don't worry. <laughs> but basically, what he was he was talking about is that uh, throughout you know throughout the the previous two decades, or even more, uh, you wrote software, and then you could just wait like two years, and your software would run twice faster. That was amazing, right? You didn't need to do anything, just wait, and bam, it's faster. But, you know, and we heard this story already a couple times now, right? It's almost 10 years since that article, that our machines are not getting any faster now in terms of we're not having, we don't have machines with 8 gigahertz, right? The, the, the CPUs. And we're starting to have more and more cores. So, you know, if we actually want to leverage all the, the capacity of the machine, it's not just waiting anymore, right? We need to change the way we write software. So the free lunch is over. And then uh, other uh, important things happened. For example, in 2007, we had the Programming Airline book published by Pragmatic Programmers by Joe Armstrong, which is one of the creators of the language. And uh, I have it here because it was when I first started to hear about Erlang, right? It brought Erlang into other communities, and in particular, uh, it brought it to communities I was involved with. And then another event that happened in this timeline is that in 2009, Rails, we had a Rails release that said that Rails was thread safe. And uh, and the reason why they did that uh, is the Rails core team, they did that, is because there was, if you were around the Rails community at that time, you, there, you, there was a pressure at that time, right, on the Rails core team, exactly, that we need to make Rails thread safe, exactly because uh, Rails developers wanted to leverage the ability of using all the cores on the machine and use the machine efficiently. And one year later, I joined the Rails core team, and I actually found out uh, that Rails was not really thread safe. That's why I put in between quotes, because uh, I was constantly uh, fixing bugs, and there was actually many reasons, not going to go into details, that Rails was not actually thread safe. So, uh, and it, so I was working on fixing those bugs, and it was kind of frustrating, it was kind of hard, and it was about that time that I started to put the pieces together, right? So if I'm doing this work and it feels hard, it feels frustrating, but I know that concurrency is becoming more and more important, and I know that there are languages 
like Erlang and many other languages uh, that solve this concurrency well, okay, um, I need to do something, right? I don't want to, uh, we need to see ways that I can make this situation better, okay? And then I s started to study, uh, learn, uh, play with other languages. And throughout this process, so I was uh, reading many books, trying to uh, get ideas from different places. I came, I found this book, Seven Languages in Seven Weeks by Bruce, who'll be speaking uh, later today. And, and I was actually familiar with the majority of the language in the book, but the thing that really stood out in that book is that it got language like Haskell, Scala, Clojure, Erlang, and a few other more, and it was talking about those languages and also their concurrency models, but it was, to me, the book really put them like in separate places, right, and had, okay, so these, um, the advantages of the approach followed by this language, here are the, the disadvantages, here are the trade-offs. And after I read the book, what really stood out was the Erlang virtual machine, right? I was saying like, I want to write software that's going to run uh, on this runtime, uh, on this ecosystem, and so that's the lesson I got from it. And the way I like to say is that I like it, so I went, uh, bought uh, more books on Erlang, um, I actually also really like it, Clojure, after I read the book, so I went to study Clojure too. It kind of shows later uh, in the language some of our features. And, uh, and the way I like to say about when I was studying Erlang, uh, uh, writing software in Erlang now, uh, trying to put some uh, things in production, is that I liked everything I saw, but I hated the things I didn't see, okay? And at first, the the things I didn't see, it was a little bit unclear, but I decided, okay, so I want to try my own language just for fun to see if I can get some of those ideas, some of those things that I'm missing, if I can get it there and see how it's going to play out. So that's how I got the first commit, okay? And uh, it was quite active. You can see like the first four months into April. It was uh, actually very active development, okay? And so here's the interesting thing. Uh, the, so I think very few people know about this, uh, probably two or three. Is, so here's how Elixir was as of April 2011. You could actually define objects with something called def object. It had a prototype-based object model, like JavaScript or self. And because I wanted you know, one of the things that I was missing uh, was metaprogramming. I actually had metaprogramming with Evol everywhere, right? Or so just passing strings and evaluating them. I like to say it's evil, evolver. <laughs> so, you know, because, and because of how it was designed, it was like slow, extremely slow, because every time you wanted to call any function, you basically had to go through the whole prototype chain. And it, I was even able to broke like some of Erlang features like hot code swapping, the ability to upgrade code live in production. And so this was my spike, right? This was the end result of Formos work. And then you can see here that after April, there was uh, no more comets, right? Because I was in the Depression Valley. <laughs> I was looking at my code and say, well, this sucks. It's really horrible, far most work, it's not good. And then there was a period of one last hope where I thought, well, I can make this work, and then you can see that, nope, I cannot. Uh, so, yeah, so, and, but the good thing is that I knew it, it sucked, right? That it was not good. And so, and the reason for that is because this is what I built, right? I was basically trying to get the ideas I was familiar with and just bring them over and try to slam them whatever way I could, right? So, oh, this, I guess I can fit it here, bam, right? Just try to make those things fit. And, uh, and that's why we got a, a bad result, right? Uh, so, 
but the good thing is that when I was doing this process, I was actually learning the shapes, right? I was, I was smashing and then I noticed that, well, this doesn't work quite as expect, right? And I was learning the shapes and maybe, oh, maybe there could be something else that I can put here. And it was from this process that we came up with the language goals, okay? So it was from this process that I stopped and I said, okay, I want to have, uh, I'm doing evolve strings. Why do I want that? Oh, I want it because it's meta programming. I can write code that writes code. And why do I want that? Well, because it can make me more productive, right? I, uh, I'm having code that's doing work for me, that's generating code. Okay, so I think productivity is one of the language goals. That sounds uh, reasonable. So, and why do I want objects? Is it because I like to design my software with objects or there is one property from objects that I'm really interested in? And then I found out that I was actually interested in polymorphism. I really like the idea of being able to say, you can give me any object. That's what we do in object-oriented languages, right? You can give me any object and as long as it implements uh, those methods or those contracts, okay? Uh, it's going to work just fine. So, okay, I want polymorphism. And why do I want polymorphism? Oh, because I can write extensible software, right? I can write a software that can work with a um, huge variety of objects or data structures, and it's going to be extensible. And then I came out with the goal of compatibility because it doesn't make sense to build a language in the Erlang virtual machine if I'm going to make it extremely slow or I'm going to break uh, important features provided by the environment um, and the ecosystem, okay? So what happens that after I had those goals, right, we ha I had a tinkering period. And this is the period that, because I, I would not be able to sit on, on, on a desk, right, and say, okay, I'm going to design this thing now and it will be ready in eight hours. So, you know, you have to read something and then you, you're, you're excused. Um, so, you know, it's the tinkering period where you do some um, research and then you completely let go of the subject, you don't think about it, and then you're reading something and then that idea comes back up and say, oh, this could lead us somewhere, right? And then you do a prototype and then it doesn't work, but it's okay, you just let it go, you go to sleep, a lot of rest is extremely important. and. So I had all this tinkering period, right? And then we see a small spike in October, and this is where we had Lagolang. Basically, it was just a specification. It was not a language that was implemented. I was traveling. I was visiting a friend, Yehuda Katz, and then I was telling him uh, what I was thinking about a language design, and, uh, and then we sat down and tried to do a couple things together and experiment with a couple ideas, and what, we wrote as Legoland came to be the basis, the foundation for Elixir. So basically what happened with Legoland, right, is that what the conversation I was having with uh, Yehuda was basically, okay, I want to have a language where I can do metaprogramming. And I found out that macros, they are extremely flexible and I would like to play with this idea of having macros in a language. But, and those macros, they are Lisp macros, right? And because they are Lisp macros, we see them in Lisp language. But how can I have, the question was, how can I combine Lisp macros with a natural syntax? And even after that, right, how can I guarantee explicitness? So uh, how can I make metaprogramming, uh, it can be very flexible, and because it's flexible, we want it to make as explicit as possible, okay? So the idea that we came out was basically, and this is, you can see, it's the foundation for Elixir, is that we came out with an extremely regular syntax, okay? So everything was a function call. So add one and two, and that's, so we have the function call, and below we have the representation of that function call, okay? So we have function calls and things that are literals, like numbers, right? One and two, they are literals. And, okay, and then everything was written in this way, like think everything. If you define that module, you would have parentheses in there, parentheses in if, everything, right? You had to have parentheses everywhere. So, and then we wrote the code and say, okay, that is very, um, the syntax is extremely regular, right? The representation is extremely regular. 
but it needs to look more natural. So what can we do? So, okay, let's make parentheses optional, right? Because now I can define a module without having parentheses around. I can call if without having parentheses around, case, and so on. Okay, and you can see that we added this syntax sugar, right? But the representation for the code stays the same. It didn't change. So, and then the next step, like, okay, let's add operators because I don't want to be writing them in the prefix notation. So we have operators in the language, but the representation doesn't change, right? It's still the function name, which in this case is the operator plus, right? And the arguments, which is one and two. So after we had this foundation, right, we, we could think about metaprogramming. And that's why today we are able to write code like this. I can have quoted expressions, right, that returns me the code representation. And I can basically generate all sorts of things in there. And, and here we can already start to see some of the explicitness because quote and unquote is very explicit. If you ever use it some lists, you actually quote and unquote, and it has shortcut syntax, right? Sometimes it's a backtick, sometimes a comma, just one character. And I said, no, I want to have it explicit, right? I want to know exactly where the quote starts. I want to know exactly where I'm unquoting to not send the message that, uh, to send underlying the message that uh, macros are flexible, but uh, and because of that, we need to use them very responsibly. I don't want to have a shortcut syntax to send a message that you just type that on a whim and let it go. Okay, so it needs to be explicit. And then we took it even further, right? So now every time you want to use a macro from another module, you need to require that module before, okay? And, and when you require the module, it's always going to be visible, okay, in that same context. So we'll never have a way, we'll never have a way in the language where you can actually inject macros globally, okay? You cannot say like, you could go to your mix file and say, okay, I want to have this macro that's going to run on all modules. We had discussion for that. We are never going to have that. They will always be explicit. I can always see the require or a use in that module or an import, right? I can always see that I am depending uh, on, those, on that particular module that provides macros. And I think we are able to reach a very reasonable set of trade-offs, okay? Uh, I like to contrast this, for, for example, with parse transforms that we have in Erlang, for example, because in Erlang, the parse transforms, you can, for example, inject them globally. You can go through the command line and say, when I'm compiling all this code here, I want it to go through this parse transform, and the parse transform actually receives the code of the whole module. So after you add a parse transform, you don't know where it's working, what what part of our code it's changing. And Elixir is explicit, uh, and the macro can only change its arguments, right? It cannot change the surrounding environment. So we got a very good set of trade-offs, and I was very happy with the result, and that's why we have this spike, right? So wait, now I think I de we defined the basic syntax, and now I think it will work. And the nice thing is that uh, since then, we never had another depression valley, okay? So this is from 2012 uh, forward. We probably just have now, all committers are at Elixir Conf valleys. So it's a really good valley to have. Um, and then, so code-wise, right? It, we never, we, we're, we are still working actively on the language and we can see from this graph, but not code-wise, a bunch of interesting happens uh, since 2011. So, for example, in January 2012, right after that spike, that spike uh, happened on my holidays mostly, the end of the year holidays. So that's the advantage of living in Poland because the winter at the end of the year is so cold that you don't want to leave home and then you can cold a lot. Uh, so after that spike, uh, I went to my company co-founders and I did a presentation to tell them, you know, you should let me work on this project full time. And they bought it, right? And, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the biggest prank I ever pulled. <laughs> and it's lasting two years and a half already. <laughs> so, but basically what I said that, what I did in this presentation is that there was, in my opinion, just one language that had everything I, I was planning and I could see in Elixir. And this language was closure, basically because 
uh, for good or for worse. Uh, closure is a dynamic language. It focuses on productivity. It focuses on extensibility. And it focuses on concurrency. Okay, so those are the four things, right? And it's exactly Elixir, right? Elixir is a dynamic language. It focuses on productivity, extensibility, and concurrency, okay? So I told them, uh, we have just one language going into this direction. And it's running on the Java virtual machine. So we gotta have another option that works uh, on, not on the Java virtual machine, in other places, right? And the Erlang virtual machine is an excellent candidate for that. So that's basically what I told them. And they said, yeah, definitely. Let's, let's try this, right? So the company came behind the project. We launched, we did the beautiful logo. Our designer did the logo. Um, I got some WordPress templates and did the website. And then we launched and, we, and it's the website we had today. We improved with time, but it's basically the foundation for the website. And um, still that year, it wasn't we launched uh, the first Elixir uh, version, right? So we got about May 2012, Elixir 0 0.5. And then in September 2012, uh, I did the first Elixir presentation at the Emerge Language uh, Camp that happens in Strange Loop. And it was really good because at the beginning of the year, I set that as a goal, right? I wanted to take the language to some place uh, and then I would go there and talk about it and uh, get some feedback. And actually, there was someone that heard about Elixir in this event from me. OK? Yes, and it's really nice. Did someone can remember watching this presentation or hearing about Elixir from back then? OK? Yeah, so it's really cool because you know I did a presentation there, and I got really good feedback. OK? And then I was, OK, I'm going, this is, this is working well, right? And then in the next year, two uh, really important, um, uh, there are two really important entries in the timeline, which is basically in May 2013, Dave Thomas announced programming Elixir. And right after, uh, Simon St. Laurent, he announced introducing Elixir by O'Reilly. And this was really big because it was at that point that to me, the language, it gained critical mass in the literal meaning of the, of the word, which is there was enough happening in the community and around to justify the language itself, okay? Because up to that point, you were already, as a company, uh, with, I guess at the time, was between 20 and 30 employees. We were investing already in this project for a year and a half, right? It's a huge investment. And uh, I wasn't certain, right? Is this really going to go somewhere, right? It's, uh, one year and a half of uh, my work, and it may not go anywhere. But when, you, when I saw that there were people like Dave and Simon, and that they were betting on the language, and they were writing about it, okay, I said, yes, this is working, right? And then uh, we had, since then, uh, a lot more books were announced. We get uh, screencasts now. Um, yeah, later, a uh, little bit later, uh, Eric joined um, the, the language and is helping build the language too. We had a whole track at Erlang Factory. We are having Elixir Conf now. So it's going really, really well, right? And the nice thing is that after all this time, okay, we are, um, two, years, we are two years after the first release at 0 0.5, uh, two years and a little bit. The language goals, they didn't change. The language goals, they are exactly the same. Uh, we kind of changed what we use to represent the, the language goals. So now when we talk about productivity, I don't like, I say now that product, productivity is first class documentation, for example, because you're not going to be productive if you're in an environment where nothing is documented, okay? So that's why uh, documentation in Elixir is uh, easy to read, it's easy, easy to access, easy to write, because we want an ecosystem that's really focused on documentation because that brings productivity at the end of the day, okay? It's a very good tooling, right? I want to install Elixir and be ready to start working on my project right now. I don't want to have extra steps. Um, a good test framework, um, good interactive Elixir shell, okay? And now we have hex packages. Eric did the presentation, which are extremely important uh, for productivity. I want to depend on something. I just add a tuple with two elements uh, in your mix file and run a comment and it is there, 
right? You are ready to, to work. So extensibility, I moved macros from productivity to extensibility because I think having macros in productivity can kind of send the wrong message that macros are to remove code duplication. And that's not what they are about. Actually, if you're thinking on code duplication, um, probably the best solution to that is a function. You don't need macros to reduce code duplication, okay? So macros is about extending the language. It's getting the language from and, and bring it, extend it to a particular domain, right? That the language is not aware at first. Like testing is a good example, or uh, Acto, which is a tool that can uh, communicate with databases. It's basically extending the language to domains. And being able to write our own data types and extend those data types is pro with protocols, right? Which is how we have polymorphism. And compatibility, right? So after that shock, after that uh, uh, Elixir that had Duff object and things are really, really slow, at first I was like, okay, we, we don't touch things related to the virtual machine, right? That's sacred. We're not going to touch that for now. But with time, we got the maturity to say, you know, uh, we have the concurrency there, we have the distribution, but you're not only going to embrace it, you're going to extend it, okay? So uh, the goals are the same, but we kind of evolved in that areas and came up uh, with our own ideas to represent that goal as a community. Um, so today, where are we today, right? So that was the past, where are we today? We are at AlexirConf. The, the current version is uh, 0.14.3. And it was a very important release because we said there are no more planned backwards incompatibilities. But the keyword here is planned, okay? <laughs> because uh, we, have, we may have unplanned backwards incompatibilities. And, and we kind of, I think the next release are going to have two small deprecations, but they are quite small. And the next release we plan, plan to be exactly Elixir 0 0.15 because it's going to introduce the logger. So today when you are building stuff uh, with OTP um, using uh, the gen server, sorry, using gen server, gen event when you create a process and it crashes, it prints everything in Erlang terms, right? So with the logger, we are going to have a very good logging API. And not only that, all the reports that come from Erlang, they'll be translated into Elixir. And we have a couple of any issues um, left that will probably fix uh, through like 0 0.15.0, 0 0.15.1. Uh, they are minor ones. And then we'll go to, well, no, right? Uh, my current time frame is that we'll have an 1.0 now in August, which me now is the best time to jump in, right? We are almost there, okay? So that was the past. Uh, and then today, so let's talk about the future. Okay, and this future is exciting because it's the no future. It's not about 1.0 because everything that had to be discussed about 1.0, we already did, right? We already, we have the Elixir core mailing list where we discuss the language development and the, for a year or even more, the majority of the language features, they are discussed to exhaustion in there. Okay, so everything is planned. Uh, there is nothing really unknown to 1.0, okay? Just uh, 1.0, just just about getting there. So this is the no one. There are about features that may be in Elixir uh, in a month, uh, in a year, in five years, or never, okay? And the nice thing about this unknown future is that all the progress and research that happens into Erlang, we can use it, right? We'll get it for free. So, so I want to start with the Erlang part, just to give an idea of what is happening there and things that we could explore. And before, and the interesting thing is that we don't need to necessarily wait for the future because there are uh, a lot of interesting features in there today that we don't use fully. For example, tracing, okay? Uh, so uh, Erlang provides uh, two functions called Erlang trace and Erlang trace pattern. And the thing is that when you are in production, uh, we have a, you have a bunch of processes, right? Exchanging and sending messages uh, to each other. And uh, if something is going wrong and you kind of want to, to see what is happening there, we can't use the bugging tools in the traditional sense because as soon as you pause a process to see what is happening there, right, the whole road around it continu continues running. So you can have other processes sending messages, but because you paused it, 
it's not going to get a reply, so this process is going to crash, it can make other things crash, and then by the time you get to see what is happening in this process, the whole environment around, uh, in the runtime changes completely. So what we do is that we do tracing, right? We, and tracing learning is really, really powerful because you can trace function calls, you can trace things related to the process life cycle, which process died, which process was created, uh, how the processes are interacting with each other. So uh, it's a really powerful tool, and I think that we can explore this in a lot of wonderful ways. So, and there is already a tool that is starting to do that, um, which is one called DBG by, by James. So I recommend everyone to try it out because now that we reach one know and we aim more towards uh, putting software in production, those tools are going to be very, very important. And I'm confident we can come up with a very interesting ways of exploring those, uh, those tracing mechanisms. Okay, so this is a tool that it's there for a while, but we haven't used it fully, fully yet. But there are things that are there in Erlang and we use it and maybe we should not. So for example, IX. IX is Elixir Interactive Shell, okay? And don't get me wrong, uh, IX is fantastic, right? They have fantastic helpers. We can do remote shells. Uh, we have Pry, which is useful for uh, debugging in development and during testing. Uh, and a bunch of other stuff. We can access the documentation and so on. But IX is also, it uses uh, IMAX mapping and it's poorly customizable. So for example, and, and that's because it runs uh, on top of the, the Erlang um, shell mechanisms, okay, which is great because it could bootstrap really, really fast, right? You can just use it and then uh, we can have a very good tool really, really fast. But it has its, uh, its advantages too. So for example, if I type to get the documentation of a module, it's going to print the whole thing and then I need to scroll back up. I would like to have a, a page, right? A way to navigate the documentation. Maybe if we, uh, depending on how we do it, we could even have links working between documentation. Could be, could be a lot of interesting things. Um, something else is that uh, there are some times that because you're using the Erlang shell, it kind of leaks. So for example, uh, if you hit Control G or Control C, you're going to get different menus and you need to write everything there in Erlang terms. Okay, I would, I would like to be able to write and see those things in Elixir terms. Okay, so this is something we could explore and we could explore in a lot of different ways. Maybe one way to explore is to um, extend uh, the shell that comes with Erlang and OTP to allow us to customize those hooks, right? And to give us a little bit more flexibility. Um, if uh, we say that the shell is so important for our uh, daily workflow, it doesn't make sense to be constrained to one editor, right? So we should have uh, maybe customized, uh, customizable mappings and things like that. So it's a really nice place that we could explore and increase even more the productivity because they're going to make the tooling better. And so those are the things that are there and we can explore and change. But there's a lot of interesting research coming uh, from Erlang. My favorite is a tool called Conqueror. Okay, who already heard of Conqueror? Okay. So it's amazing because imagine, imagine this, imagine you have like two processes, okay? So you have a client and you have a key value server that receives a key that you store and then you can read this key later. So you can send in a message, okay? I want to put this key in this value. And then later you can say, oh, I want to get that key I stored and it's going to return the key uh, to you, okay? So this, we write this code today, it's fine. And then you put it in production and then you say, wait, this, Key value server is actually a bottleneck in production because there's a lot of people reading all the time. And then, okay, I want to do something. And then you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to use a ETS table, right? So now, every time I want to, to write a key, I'm going to send it to the server because I still want to serialize the write through the server. And then the server writes to the table. But now every time I want to read, okay, uh, I'm going to read it directly from the table. And, if you, and then you do this optimization, right? And then you put into production and your code is going to fail, right? Things are not working as expected. And the reason for that is because you're not uh, acknowledging the rights, right? So what could happen is that you're expecting exactly this case to, to happen. You write and then you read, but the key value server, it could, it could be busy doing other stuff, okay? And then the write's going to happen just after the read. So now when you read stuff, it's going to crash. You just optimize your code and now you get a crash, okay? It doesn't make sense. So what Conquero does 
is that instead of, our, of you waiting this to happen in, in production, Conquer can actually find this stuff during development stage, okay? So basically what Conquer is, is systematic concurrency testing. Basically what it does is that every time you have communication or points where you're sharing, kind of sharing state like ETS, you, it instruments those points and it generates all possible comp combinations this code could execute systematically, okay? And then that's how it's able to, to tell you that, wait, this flow can happen to and the result you expect is not going to happen in this, uh, in this interleaving, this combination of events. So you can check more about Conquerer, right? There is this website. And uh, the nice thing is that we could have it in Elixir. So one of the ways we could benefit from Conquerer in Elixir is that um, every time something goes wrong, it prints a report. So we could start by having reports written in Elixir terms, okay? But we could also think of XUnit integration. You could think that we could write a test and then you just put on top of it, tag Conquerer, right? And when you do that, it's going to automatically run Conquerer in that particular test. And that would be really, uh, really, really awesome because we can do more systematic tests, uh, concurrency tests in our software, okay? And there are a bunch of other initiatives in Erlang, right? So you can, uh, and Francesco and Robert, they are here. They're going to uh, speak after. And then if you want to know more about those things, you can ask them. Uh, Robert is involved in another very interesting project, which is SD Erlang, Scalable Distributed uh, Erlang. So it's always a good place to explore, okay? So that's a very exciting future already, right? But we are also going to write our own future, right? What we want. And, and to so to show some ideas, so I have some ideas, but they are just ideas, okay, uh, of what we can do, what we can explore. For example, we could have discriminated unions in the language. So imagine that you're implementing a calculator, right? And then you type, uh, and then in the calculator you put one plus two, and then you need to parse that output, and then at some point you have those tokens, right? I have the token plus with the left number and the right number, I have the minus token with the left, right, and uh, the left number and the right number, and so on. And that's when we do the calculation, right, uh, the, uh, of, of those operators that we, we, we have. And imagine that there are a couple other places, like two or three places, where you need to repeat and match in, in those exactly same tokens, right? You need to match on them. So what happens is that in the future, we want to add exponentiation, for example. What's going to happen here is that when you add exponentiation, you can add to one, but forget to add it in the other places where you're matching, right? So you have a bug. And uh, it would be nice if the, if the language could actually tell you, hey, you forgot to check this case, right? That's what discriminated unions are, are about. You could define a, a union called the calculator operators, and then you have plus that receives left and right, and so you define exactly, right, what you want to match and what is the representation of those things that you want to match. And, and now when we go back to that code, every time you want to match, you can match it like this, matching on this discriminated union. So now in the future, if you want to add a new operator, you just add it to the discriminated union, and then you compile our code, and it's going to say, you forgot to handle this case here, you forgot to handle this case here, and you forgot to handle this case here. And the nice thing is that if you have, like, complex patterns, let's suppose you want to match that and all of them, that left and right, they are also integers, right? You actually, you actually be able to remove that verbosity too because the patterns and, and the conditions, they would all be embedded in this plus, minus, uh, mode, and uh, division from, from the union. And the nice thing about this is that because the language wa uh, was built uh, with macros and much of the core of the language is built with macros itself, we don't need to wait, right? We don't need to wait about this being implemented in the language. We, you could go home and write this code today. It, you know, there is no need to fork the language or anything. It can start as a separate project. So I like to say that from now on, right, the language development is decentralized, okay? Because we can all play and explore with the ideas we want, okay? And we don't need to wait for, for anything to happen. It, uh, the foundation is there. For example, another interesting idea is uh, for comprehensions. We could extend them more. So uh, the way for comprehensions works today, so here um, 
I am saying for all, uh, for all, every user in users, right? Uh, if the user has age more than 18, I want to get um, the favorite drinks for that user and return a list, right, uh, with those tuples containing the username and the favorite drink. Okay, so this is a, is a very powerful construct. And the way comprehensions work is that we have generators. So this one has two generators, okay? And we have filters that filter on what you are iterating, okay? And this is how it works today. And uh, I mean, it's, so we had old comprehension style, the four is relatively new. And the reason we, we did that is because we really want to make it powerful. So uh, the users can be any enumerable, right? So you can pass sets there, you can pass leads, uh, lists, dictionaries, and they would all work. You can all, you can all, you can comprehend on them, okay? And when we did this new four comprehension style, we also added uh, a new key, which is into. So, so let's suppose that to you, this is a set, right? The, the user with its favorite drinks. So you can actually say, I want to get this result and put into a set. And you're going to get a set out of it. And this works today, okay? So uh, basically say that everything that uh, you can pass in into, you can pass anything you want as long as it's collectible. So a generator is kind of the art of taking values out of things while the collectible is about collecting those values and put it into somewhere. And you can pass files in there. So you can have loops that are right into files. So for example, you can pass um, a, you can do into the standard output and then you have strings coming from the, the block, right? So in this case, uh, for every line, you're saying uh, this user likes this drink, okay? And it's printing every time something new comes or every time something is there into the standard output, okay? So this is uh, basically how it works today, but we, as I said, we can extend, we can take the next level. So for example, we could have ordering, okay? So I actually want to order my results by the user age. And this is expressive because uh, you can see that I'm ordering by age, uh, but the age is not in the final result. Try to imagine how you would write this code if age uh, if you didn't have this construct, right? You would have to put age in the result and then you would need to sort and then we would need to take age of, of the result. So it adds more steps. And here it's uh, expressive and we can actually optimize and try to figure out the best way of doing this operation. And since I already had uh, order by, why not group by two, right? Let's, it's the next uh, logical step into this. So we could uh, uh, group by the drinks, okay? And this is nothing really new, okay? Uh, we can look into, it reminds everyone of uh, SQL, right? Um, which is uh, a query language, which is exactly what we are doing here. We are querying the data structures and trying to get information out of it. Uh, but we have a bunch of interesting uh, implementations of the same ideas in other languages. So there is a paper from Haskell called Comprehensive Comprehensions that it explores the same ideas. Common Lisp has a loop macro that can do all sorts of stuff, like the documentation is like, five to 10 pages, really, of all the possible combinations uh, of what you can do. We don't need to go that crazy, but it shows the different ways to approach. And there is a more recent package from CommonList called uh, Duplus, which again, um, same ideas, right? So, and again, we don't need to wait, right? We could go home and let's build this new comprehension and see how those new ideas uh, work. Are they really useful? And so you could go home today and say, okay, I'm going to implement my for comprehension, and then you start to write this code, and then you figure out that you cannot actually write this. Because in Elixir, we don't have variable arguments. You cannot have a macro that receives uh, uh, whatever number of arguments. Because here we can have like R two generators, or you can have 10 generators, right? You can have one filter, or you can have 10 filters. So uh, this doesn't work, but there is uh, an easy cheat, which is basically to remove the my underscore for, we can just take the underscore out and write it like this, and now it works. And the reason for that is because um, this code is the same as this, right? So now what you're doing is that you're calling my with just one argument, which is the whole for expression. And you can transform it to something else, and then you can transform it into the actual code that's going to execute, okay? And if we explore this idea, right, if you go into this direction, there are a lot of interesting concepts that we can do. We can do a stream for. Today, every time you have a comprehension, the results, they come right away. But you could have a comprehension 
that returns a string, man, the, the, the comprehension is going to uh, execute just when you want to actually get the values. Or even uh, more interesting, we could have a parallel for. Right? It's basically, you can say, uh, so in this case, for every user, and if the user is an investor, I want to fetch its profile. Okay? And the fetch can be uh, a long operation. right? You can need to reach another service. So this is just going to create the process for you and do everything in parallel and give you the result back. And then there are many different things we can explore if we go into this direction, right? And that's when we are, so this remembers us of the compatibility goal because you're going to be using the foundation for concurrency and distribution in the virtual machine to, to explore those very powerful constructs, okay? And then we can talk about should this unbound, like if I have 100 users, should I create 100 processes? Or should I have a pool of processes that is, is asking uh, for users to calculate the profile? Uh, how can I have pipelines of data, right? Just going through and calculating things in parallel, okay? And I could go on. Uh, when originally I wrote this talk, it was almost uh, two hours of talk because I just put all the ideas that came to my mind. Um, but that's not the message here, okay? The message is that everyone here, right, uh, you have your own ideas too of what things you would like to see in the language, or what you would like to see in the ecosystem, your own projects, okay? And, and this is great, and that's exactly the idea, right? We, we are going to decentralize now the language development, the system development, uh, the, the foundation is there. And the message here is, is that uh, because we are new as a community, we are going to build a lot of those, okay? We are going to, we are going to um, try a lot to bring the ideas you're most familiar with, okay? And you're just going to try to smash that, right? But that's fine, as long as you remember that we are doing this, okay, to feel the shapes, right? It's a learning process. And um, we need to be careful in this process, right? To not bring, uh, so we need to be careful to bring the good ideas, to find the good ideas, right? But leave the bad ideas out. And for that, right, uh, we need a tinkering period, okay? So uh, let's not forget about this period uh, where we do research and then we completely let it go of the problem because it's not uh, banging your head against the desk that are going to come up with a solution, okay? So there is the sleep, there is the, the fun parts, there are the prototypes, okay? So um, we need the tinkering. And yeah, so happy tinkering for everyone. Thank you. Um. I noticed you didn't uh, reference link from C sharp, which seems really similar to the comprehension syntax you propose. And yep. in link for link, um, C sharp lets you do it both for uh, SQL, XML, and data sets, which I guess would just be any enumerable. So if we had the new comprehension syntax, would it make sense to change um, or e either wrap Ecto's syntax to use the comprehension syntax instead? So, um, so the thing about Link, and we, I discussed a lot with Eric uh, when we were working on the actual project, a lot of the criticism against Link is that you cannot actually write a query that is going to be good for data structures and good for, for going to the database. There will always be semantic issues, and you can write a query that's going to be very fast in one, extremely slow in the other and vice versa. So when we wrote Ecto, which is about writing query syntax to the database, we explicitly said we are not going to have a way to work with data structures. And the reason I mentioned the Haskell Comprehensive Comprehensions paper is because a lot of people that worked, uh, so Microsoft, they have fantastic research, right? Fantastic research team. Uh, and a lot of people that work on the link, they got the idea from links and said, okay, how can we add this back to Haskell, for example? So that is the, is the inspiration. Is to, is to do the same process they did of taking the ideas out of Link and put into the language. Thank you. No, I just wanted to make Jim run back and forth up the room. <laughs> so every good community needs a great origin story, and we got 90% of it here. What we need is the name. Why the name? Where did it come from? Oh, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. Really, it's... Yeah, it just appeared, and then, well, sounds good. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it's easier to Google than Go, that's for sure. One of the things that I always struggle with is we're all good at using and consuming the things that you put so many blood, sweat, and tears into. How can we help grow the community? And I know it's, there are a lot of things that can be done, but is there one place where we can go that it says, here's where we need help, documentation, anything to get involved and try to push it forward? So, yeah, so this is exactly how, uh, one of the ways you can help if you're thinking about code, right? is exactly go uh, put values on your ideas, explore it, and if, if you are always feel a little bit lost, remember the language goals, right, while you are focusing on. So if you are starting a new project, remember that uh, documentation is extremely important, right, and that's one of the things. Remember that um, macros, they are not your API, so they are flexible, right, they are good to extend uh, the domain, but they are not their API, they are just an expression level, and then we can build the ecosystem around these ideas, and I think are going to get a very uh, powerful uh, result, a very flexible, expressive community, a fun community. So that's one of the ways to help. And then there are all the other ways that, as you said, right, like co-documentation. So uh, how can we make the documentation more accessible? So one of the challenges that if you go to functional programming language conferences, right, one of the challenges is that how can we get uh, people to think functionally. And the, so this is where we can, how, okay, yes, we, we, this is something that we need to answer to, right? It's our problem too, okay? So uh, we can think uh, about all those ways. How can we think concretely, uh, concretely functionally? So let's write materials on that, um, uh, have meetups and all the other ways that we can have the, the community grow, making more accessible materials and so on. So yeah, at this point, the language itself, it's really, we are getting one no, and it's exactly the point that uh, the, because one no can mean a lot of things, right? It can mean, okay, this is, you're not going to change this. But for us, one no is like, we got the, the core to really grow on, right? And yeah, so that's how we, we can spread. This is kind of a question for you and Eric both. Where do you guys see Ecto going? Do you see adding like support for React and other databases? And what do you see in the future for Ecto? So yeah, we want to add support for other other adapters. Um, the thing is that right now we are both focused uh, strongly on Elixir and uh, Eric no Hex, which are more are higher in the priority list. But my plan is exactly after. When it was out, I can focus more on those tools that I really would like to. It's just uh, we don't have the time right now. And then we hope we can uh, bring Acto to one well, no, not too far from now. Hey, so uh, I followed the mailing list. It seems to be a little high traffic lately. Uh, and then sometimes I, I hang out on IRC uh, in, in the Elixir Lang channel. I'm wondering if it's time to maybe open up a forum, like a discourse or something like that, so it's easier for people to, to kind of follow with the language and its developments uh, at their own pace. Definitely, I'm not familiar with discourse, but just go to, go to the mailing list that we have there and uh, spin the idea around, and, and let's see, because I, I'm really not familiar to give an answer what is best or worse, but the point is exactly to if everyone says it's the best way to consume the information, I, I, I don't care for what means as long as everyone is consuming it in a very good way. Uh, hi. I'm curious about uh, what you think are some of the major parts of the OTP that have not been wrapped for Elixir yet and maybe should be. Oh, that's, that's a good question. So, um, so there's this tracing thing that uh, we really could explore. There are releases which already have a tool uh, that is being, yeah, so there's already, and there are releases and there is a tool which everyone should use and try. So we still talk about using it to build RPM packages. Um, and yeah, there is really a lot of stuff. And uh, so for example, testing coverage, so today, so it was one of my original slides, for example, today if you run mixed test cover, it's going to generate a coverage report. But um, 
the HTML for that was probably written in the 80s. So we can really prettify, and we can probably actually do this contribution back to OTP and have uh, nice reports with consolidated pages. So there is, yeah, there is really a, a lot of a lot of things in there that we can we can we can explore and try to integrate more. And it also goes on uh, cases like per need, right? So I've heard some people there actually using the telecommunication specific stuff uh, that comes with OTP, and you know, so and when you have this need, you can go there and learn it and try to make it. Um, try to expose it to different way in Elixir and so on. So, yeah, many, many options. I don't have a concrete, concrete answer. Um, on the topic of coverage, I, I just discovered last week that there's bindings for coveralls.io. And so coveralls.io is a website where it's free for open source, so that would cover most of our stuff. Okay. Um, where it'll, it has mixed tasks for coverage, and there will be there's HTML reports that get posted to coveralls.io that are very nice because I use coveralls for my Ruby projects. Oh, so that's nice to hear. It's not built in, and it's built on top of the cover library from Erlang, but the reports are very nice. So that could be an alternative to a better reports that we develop. Yeah, thank you. I uh, recently read uh, through an interview with uh, one of the main developers on Rust. Um, I know you know Steve, so. Um, but he was talking about one of the things that excited him the most about Rust <coughs> was the fact that it made use of a lot of fairly recent academic research into language theory. And I think you've done an amazing job at making, an el making Elixir a really modern language with really modern features. But Erlang itself I'm not as familiar with as I am with Elixir. I know that Erlang dates back to, I believe, the 80s um, when they developed it originally and it was open source later. But do you think that going forward, Elixir will be able to take advantage of as many things as you would like, given the fact that it's still very tightly coupled to some of the things that Erlang itself chooses to implement or not implement? Um, so there, are, there could be some constraints. So for example, uh, when we're talking about parallel for, there are some uh, parallelism uh, algorithms that would uh, benefit of not copying the data, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I don't think it's it, so it could constrain that in that way. But there are alternatives, and I would 99% of the cases to take the alternative and live with the constraints I have today, mm -hmm. than the opposite, right? To be able to escape the constraints and everything that it guarantees, just because I want that one percent to do that. And, and so, and yes, and there is a bunch of, that's, that's what I said about Erlang, there's a bunch of interesting uh, research happening in there too. Um, it's interesting also because we have Riak, the database, that runs um, in the Erlang virtual machine as well, and they do a bunch of, they, they are very close to, so we have the recon event uh, with Riak, and there's a, a bunch of distributed uh, research happening there as well, which uh, I believe that, so I had slides for that in my talk, that was, that's why it was almost two hours long, but um, uh, that we could actually use uh, on our workflows as well, incorporate some of that research nicely into Elixir, right, exactly because of the, the expressivity that we can have in the language. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, that's all the time we have. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you.